Yes. Patrick Ferenga uh, actually spoke to a group that I was involved in oh, 10, almost 20 years ago now. It's interesting that group, which was a, another conservative group. Um, yeah. It was being run by a gentleman who uh, was speaking to a Republican Confederate later because he wasn't really terribly conservative, he was a Republican, so he was intrigued by us. And he said to this friend, he said, I just discovered that among the conservatives that I in this group that I the question was not whether we should how we should reform education, but whether we should have public education at all. And uh, he found this idea completely astonishing. Um, because again, the public sets the parameters of what is considered education, and it usually has to do with institutions and political and economic entities rather than the issue itself. Patrick Ferenga uh, is, well, he can tell you about the John Holt but better than I can. Uh, something that started in Massachusetts, because the John Holt bookstore used to be in Cambridge for a very long time. Patrick Ferenga. Thank you. So, uh, in this, back in 1981, uh, right up the street here at 729 Boylston Street. Uh, John Holt, his first office was at 308 Boylston Street, then he moved to 729 as the magazine was growing. He published a magazine called Growing Without Schooling, and he outgrew the space in 308, moved into 729. But when I got there, I just graduated, I got my master's in English. I was going to be a teacher, but they passed Proposition Two and a Half, and they weren't hiring teachers back in 1981. So I wound up working down the street here at the Booksmith. And then uh, John Holt was an avid reader. He was in that store every day. And uh, one day you know, I found out that he needed a volunteer to type up his letters and correspondence. And I volunteered because I wanted to learn word processing. And um, I learned about John's, yeah, back then there were separate machines. Right? And now I'm really dating myself, the old Wang word processor. So anyway, uh, John had to go, um, had to go on a tour of Scandinavia where he spoke for three months. <laughs> and so I, I just met him for like maybe an hour and then I went up working in the office three months when he wasn't there. So I was reading his books and one of the things that he did was in 1976 he wrote a book called Instead of Education, Ways to Help People Do Things Better. Why did he do that? Because his very first book, this one, How Children Fail, was based on his experiences as a fifth grade teacher First at the Rocky Mountain School, a private school in Colorado, which is still around. Then here in Massachusetts, the Commonwealth School, the Fairweather School. He was fired from both of them. <laughs> he was he fired, fired from, from that Tony private school. Fairweather. Oh, he was. Yeah, he was fired from every school he taught at because eventually, you know, he, he, the students liked him, but the faculty didn't. <laughs> he was. He stopped giving tests, and then he was able to prove being based on using the school's own records, that the kids' scores were still doing well, that the kids were actually still flourishing because they were doing other things in the classroom. He bought in trumpets and typewriters. He a biofeedback machine so they could see themselves getting uptight. And he would say, relax, you can't learn if you're uptight. So that's one of his great insights. Fear and humiliation are why children fail, not lack of intelligence. And so it's the environment. So he's trying to change the environment. So to make a long story short, he wrote five other books then he comes to, instead of education, you know, how, how can we change? So he's looking at places that weren't mandatory schools, like Berlitz schools and um, cooking schools, karate schools, um, community college courses that people take one off. Why do people do this without being compelled? And so he's writing all these examples of, of, of this. And finally, the book ends with a call to get away from what he calls the most destructive force in, that we've created, which is com universal compulsory education, because it controls the thoughts increasingly of, of people from the time they're born to the, until, until they internalize that they can't have an original thought, <laughs> and that, it must be, that they must learn. As Ivan Illich, who wrote the book Deschooling Society in 1971, and that book influenced Holt a lot. He studied with Illich in Cuernavaca from 71 73, trying to figure this out. And he, and he still, still took a while. At the end of Instead of Education, he said, We need to have an underground railroad to get kids out of school. And that's when people started to write him, saying, You don't need an underground railroad. You can teach them yourself. And then he found out that there were people homeschooling in a commune in Washington State 
an ind independent family homeschooling in Tidewater, Virginia. And they're all starting to write to him. And he realized none of them, he didn't even know that these people existed, let alone that they didn't know each other. So he started the magazine, Grown Without Schooling, as a way to start to put everybody together. And the directory function of our magazine, we had people subscribe to the magazine, started in 1977, and I published it until uh, 2001. Uh, John died in 1985, and I continued publishing for 16 years. And um, throughout, throughout all that, you know, John's experience as a teacher, I mean, everyone thinks that he taught in, pri in public school. And John's like, no, I taught in the best private school. And this charade of learning that I'm talking about takes place in these schools constantly. What's the charade of learning? You've, you've probably done it. Well, John is a teacher. I give a test on Friday. They pass it. I give the same test on Monday. They fail it. What happened? He did this. And, he, and, and this book is a series of memos uh, between him and his co-teacher, Bill Hull, on this question. I teach, but they don't learn. And, you know, I mean, it's a very, it's something that as you study education, if you read about it in the papers or watch, this is a constant issue. <laughs> it was about motivating kids. Well, then John's second book is called How Children Learn. He said, you don't need to motivate kids to learn. You know, I mean, John was on children are learning in the womb. They recognize voices. <laughs> children know they're, they're programmed to learn. I mean, it's our, it's our nature. You know, birds fly, fish swim, humans learn. You know? So why is it that we think that this gets, that they can't learn? Why do we infantilize children? Well, it's gotten to the point where we, we don't think that, if, you know, you can learn anything until, well, now we're starting kids at second grade, right, with, you know, New York has instituted uh, universal, well, I don't think it's compulsory, but universal preschool for those who want it. And um, now we're trying to, in Massachusetts, we're always trying to get the, the leaving age pushed up from 16 to 18. You know, and we just and you know and Holt's ideas were why do we keep doing the same thing over and getting the same results and expecting different results? And let's try something different. So what about letting a child choose what they want to learn? And so, and based on his own experiences and a te as a teacher trying to do that and then talking with homeschoolers, he found out that they you know, that this actually happens. And and as my experience, and I'm sure that, you know some of the more experienced homeschoolers here will tell you that the, if you start off as a very conventional school at home, uh, homeschooler, eventually your children are going to lead you away from that in one way or another. They're going to develop an interest in stringed instruments. And that's not on most schools' curriculums these days at all. I had a five-year-old daughter. All three of our girls were homeschooled. They're now 28, 24, and 21. All three have gone two to four-year college, one to community college, one's living in Houston, them well. She only went to one year of school. My middle daughter uh, wanted to go to high school, and then my third daughter went to high school. But I, had home I actually homeschooled my our third daughter because my wife. Uh, that was when Holt Associates closed in 2001, and so I was going. I was at home more. And my wife wound up working, so we switched roles there, and I was able to homeschool her for four years, and that was a great, a great experience. But this whole idea that. You know, if, so therefore, if you don't need a curriculum, if you don't need to tell them what to learn, but you need to show them how to learn. They have questions, you answer them. How do I play the piano? How do I add? You show them. You know, this idea that in first grade you teach them to do math, and in second grade, you know, you, you can then teach them, uh, I mean, addition. Then in second grade you can teach them division, and third grade multiplication. The way we do it is, is crazy. I mean, oh, John Holt was off, in, in the book Legacy of John Holt, which I, I uh, co-wrote and published last year. He was um, the head of the National Weather Service was saying, uh, who was a friend of John's, um, Dr. Barry and Moore was saying that he and John often said, why can't they teach calculus to kids in fifth grade? He says it, it, it would be perfectly doable, but we've made it seem so impossible because we stretched it out. Uh, John's examples that he liked were Suzuki education. You know, Suzuki, they could teach a six-year-old to play Mozart on the violin. And they, and they love it, right? In America, you get kids with rhythm band, and we, they, we can't keep time up until eighth grade, you know? It's like, why, why do we make things so hard? I mean, we split them up and treat kids like they can't do it. So John's idea is invite them in. The apprenticeship, the internship, the, you know, the club model. Let's get people of all ages. Let, let's do it this way. Let's learn not so much by sit down, shut up, and do as I say. Sometimes that's appropriate, particularly if you have a lecture with a big group. Yeah, it makes sense. But you know, 
more often than not, especially when you're dealing with kids, coaching. The coaching model makes much more sense than sitting around and saying, okay, da 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 da. But it works, every child is different. Some, and every parent's style is different. And that's one of the, the beauties of, of homeschooling, as Malcolm had said earlier, too. It's just, there's many different ways of doing it. All three of my daughters learned to read, but they all learned in different ways. My oldest, we used. We, sorry, said we used your book, but we didn't buy any any products or anything like that. You know, we used post-it notes and index cards. Made our flashcards, put the endings and the prefixes. That's it. And Lauren, she read just like you'd expect by third grade. She was right where she should be. Right. Our second daughter, Allison, she had meningitis when she was nine months old, so she has a hearing deficit. Phonics wasn't working very well for her. <laughs> she, she had trouble forming, she had a little aphasia from, from this, and so she had trouble forming words. But the whole language method, she could see stop, exit, you know, signs like that, she picked up on it. That worked great for her. And then what really got her were Nintendo games. Because back then the Nintendo games didn't, weren't sophisticated enough to have the voice talk. They printed the words at the bottom of the screen. So my job as her father was to read her all the Nintendo stuff. And of course, I played it with her. But that's how she eventually learned to read. And then our youngest, when she was five, she was reading. <laughs> Didn't teach her. <laughs> but she was read to constantly by us and her sisters. So you know, there's all sorts of ways to do this. But school, there's only one. So. I urge you to just consider all the different options that are available and that you as a parent are as good as any teacher that you can do it and that your children can do it too. A lot of people just you know, underestimate their kids. Don't underestimate children. If you, if you give them your faith and hope, they'll, you know, and if they love and respect you, they will rise to that. Thank you.